But when his light went out, God didn't bother to light another one. And he hasn't replaced these prophets that have been stoned. And last fall, as I thought about it, I remembered the Civil War. And when they fought, if it was convenient, they lined up in an open field, you know. And when both sides were ready, their firing lines stood up, sometimes 100, 200, 300 men in a single line with muskets capable of firing one shot. And they'd rise up out of their trenches in one big, long, single line, and they'd pull their muskets and shoot. But they not all went back to reload. Some of them dropped right where they stood. But the ones who survived went back, and they were replaced. The dead ones were replaced with others, and the next line came up, and the line was as long as it was before. And I got to thinking about those firing lines, how they fell back. And then they kept falling back till there wasn't any replacement. And then when there wasn't any replacements, they just kept firing until there wasn't any more line. And I thought of God's servants like that in this country in the past quarter of a century. The firing line fired their volley and they fell back. And each time they came back up to the line, there was less of them than there was before. And I've been noticing this now over the past 25 years. This is one of my observations. I notice that every year there's less in the firing line than there ever was before. You believe that? That's right. Less in the firing line than there ever was before. I have this observation. Christians are dying and going home to be with the Lord, but they aren't being replaced. I heard a man say not long ago, and I have to agree with him, and he's a man who has a sharp perspective of the religious world. He's a man who's traveled a lot, and he's seen the religious community in our country. And this is a statement he made, a profound statement. And I thought, well, at least there's two people in this country who feel the same way, because I feel the same way. And he made this statement. He said, I have observed that Christians are not being replaced as they once were. Christians are going to be with the Lord, but God isn't replacing them. And he said, I think if this continues for another 20 years, listen, I think if this continues for another 20 years, there will not be a Christian in America. Now, this is what I mean when I say that the lights are going out. Well, you say, isn't anybody getting saved? I can't tell you who gets saved. I can remember that there was a time when one man died and ten got saved in his place. There was a time when one believer went to be with the Lord, and before morning there was ten more knew the Lord. Maybe in the same community, maybe in the same household. It doesn't happen like that anymore. And there are several reasons for it, and one of them, hear this very carefully, the gospel is not being preached, and people can't get saved unless the gospel's preached. But you say there's more gospel preaching than there's ever been in the United States. That's true, but it's the wrong gospel. The gospel that's being preached is the gospel of the kingdom. Men are being told to be disciples. Men are being taught to be learners. Men are being baptized and told about the kingdom. Men are being taught the things to observe that Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. People are being sent out all over the world to evangelize the world and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is not the gospel that saves men. This is the gospel of the kingdom. It has no power. It is as powerless as any other doctrine of any other ism on the face of the earth. The gospel that saves is the gospel of God's grace. It is of imputed righteousness. It is of the finished work, the substitutionary atonement, the bloody gospel, the gospel of the blood that was shed at the cross of Calvary and carried into heaven and sprinkled on the mercy seat. The gospel that saves, brethren, is a gospel that's without works. It's of a righteousness that's granted as a free gift of grace by God. And oh, it doesn't have anything to do with church and it doesn't have anything to do with religion. It doesn't have anything to do with doing. It doesn't have anything to do with discipling the nations. And it doesn't have anything to do with evangelizing the world. It has to do with guilty sinners coming to God by Jesus Christ, resting wholly and solely in the work he did at the cross of Calvary and having sparked in their hearts a genuine love for him that makes him a reality to them. This gospel is not being preached. It's the gospel of the kingdom that's being preached, and I want to repeat it again, even if it makes all you church people mad, 
You may have a sincere preacher. You may have a sincere church. If you're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, there's nobody getting saved in your church. Nobody ever did get saved in your church, and nobody ever will get saved in your church. Because the gospel of the kingdom can't get anybody saved. And I have a verse for you. When Jesus spoke of his coming, he said, when the Son of Man comes, what did he say? Will he find faith on earth? He raised the question, when I come, will I find any faith? Will I find anyone who believes on the earth? Do you know how faith comes? It comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. If Jesus wonders if he will find faith when he comes, then he's wondering if the word will be preached when he comes. Because wherever the word is preached, faith is generated. But, oh, brethren, he said, I wonder if I'll find the faith. I wonder because the word is not going to be preached anymore. In Amos, the eighth chapter, don't you remember the Old Testament prophet who spoke about the last days? And he said there would be a famine in the land in those days. What kind of a famine did he say it would be? A famine for the hearing of the words of the Lord. He said men would go from east to west and north to south and not be able to find it. Do you believe that? Yes. That's happening right here in America. Go north and south and east and west. We've been asking that for years. Where is it being preached? Who's preaching it? And I can hear some of you people out there in tape land. My goodness sake. This man thinks he's the only man in the world that's preached the gospel. I won't say I'm the only man in the world that's preaching the gospel, and I don't say I'm the only man in America preaching the gospel, but I want to send a message to you. If there's anybody else out there, please let me know, will you? Please let me know. I drive 100 miles to hear you preach. I drive 100 miles to hear you preach, maybe 500. Oh, listen, I can go and... I can go and hear this modern-day evangelism that tells the sinner to leave his sins and be sorry for his sins and promise God he's going to abandon his sins and come and give his life to Christ and serve the Lord. Let me tell you what that is. That's nothing. There's no truth in it. There's no gospel in it. There's no good news in it. There's nothing but the lies of Satan in it. No. Here's the strange thing is that the late lights are going out in America and nobody even knows it. And I'll tell you, if this isn't true, if there isn't a famine in the land for the true word of God, if it isn't true that God's voices are not being replaced, then I ask you to explain to me the phenomena of the tape ministry. Explain to me the phenomena of the tape ministry. Explain to me these letters that come every day from all over the United States saying it's the only bit of truth they've been able to find any place. If there are prophets in the land, where are they? How come the city of Birmingham is not overflowing with men preaching the gospel? How come Atlanta, Georgia doesn't have 500 men preaching the gospel? How come it is that I get letters from these places saying, send us more, send us more? And you know what they're telling us? They're telling us that they're being fed like the ravens fed Elijah in the wilderness. They tell me that they're getting their feeding from these tapes, that God's ministering to them through these tapes. And if the lights are on so brilliantly, where are the lights? We sure save a lot of postage. That's the problem. I want to explain this to you, and uh, this message, you know, will be indefinitely long because I'm going to finish it tonight. Let me explain this to you. In the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, we have the, the seven national uh, uh, feasts that God established for Israel, religious observances, and one of those is called the Feast of the First Fruits. And the first fruits was a national feast at harvest time. And when the harvest was ready, the people went into their fields and they took a little bit of the harvest. And the first fruits that they brought out of that field, they made up in sheaves and they carried them to the, to the tabernacle and they presented them to the Lord. And the priest took them and waved them before the Lord and they were called the wave sheaves, remember? It was kind of a thanksgiving time, thanking God for the harvest. 
giving him the tithe, the, the cream of the crop, the top of the pile. That's what the word tithe means, the heap, the top of the heap. So they brought, they brought their tithe. They brought their, uh, the, first, the first sheaves that come in out of the field. And they had the priest present them to the Lord as a thank offering. And then they were permitted to go into the field and take the harvest, which they did. But when they went in to take the harvest, they were instructed of the Lord in the law that they were never to harvest the corners. They left the corners standing, and the corners were called the gleanings. And these corners were left for the benefit of the poor of the community, those who couldn't afford a crop. So after the harvest had been taken, the poor would come in and search the fields out and go around all the corners of the harvest field and take the gleanings, and they'd get the little bit that was left. And that's not by accident, you see, that this is in the book. And it isn't by accident that God speaks of the winning of souls or the bringing of people to Jesus as a harvest. Read of the, of the gospel in mystery form, uh, and you'll read much about the, the man who went out to sow his field and about the harvest that came. And, and the bringing of people to the Lord Jesus Christ in the last 2,000 two, years, think of it as a harvest. The first fruits have already been presented to the Lord. <laughs> Do you know when those first fruits were presented to the Lord? When the Lord Jesus went into glory and carried his own blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat and gathered up all the Old Testament saints out of paradise. Yeah. And he took them up there in the presence of God and waved them as a sheaf offering. They were spoken of as the first fruits of his ministry. They were allowed into heaven because he had shed his blood and had carried his blood there and sprinkled heaven with it. Oh, that was the first sheaf the first fruits, and then the harvest began, and Paul and Peter and John and other men like Timothy, they went out into the field, they began to take the harvest, and boy, wasn't their harvest taken? And the harvest continued, and I can remember when the harvest was taken here in this country too, and you can too. You can remember perhaps some of you back to a time when it wasn't any unthink, unusual thing for a hundred people or two hundred people or three hundred people to come to know the Lord, and I mean genuinely come to know the Lord, right? The harvest is past. We've been in the gleaning period for a long time. There's one saved here, one saved there, one here, one there, just a few, not many, and there never will be many. No amount of prayer meetings is going to change that in America. No amount of revivals will ever change it. There will be no end time revival in America. There will be no end time renewal in America. The lights will never go on again. They are on their way out. And there's nothing but darkness ahead. Where are the gleanings? They're out there. We hear from them every day. And they're being fed in the wilderness. Now, let me talk to you for just a few minutes about how the lights are going out. Jesus is the true light, and he's in us. And the book of Philippians in the second chapter tells me that the saints are luminaries. They are to shine, the scripture says, as stars or luminaries in this godless world. Each of us was put in our respective place in this country for a reason. And we're shining here. However dim we may shine, remember stars don't make too much light. And stars were never intended to light the world. The light of the world has gone out in America. The light of the world is hidden for a moment. The sun cannot be seen now, only the moon. And I think the, the moon in America is in the dark of the moon right now. And only a few stars, that's all. And the stars are believers wherever they are. They don't give out much light, but they're in their place. And they're giving out whatever little bit of light they can reflect of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this isn't anything they do. All they have to do is just be in their place and believe me, Jesus will shine off of them. He'll reflect himself off of them. And he'll make some little bit of light from every one of us. And we're in our places. But here's the strange thing that's happening. Just like the stars in the heavens, when they burn out, are not replaced. I notice that when these stars burn out, no new ones take their place. And so each one that goes home to be with Jesus makes America just a little bit darker than it was the day before. In 2 Corinthians 5, we are called his ambassadors. And you know that when a country re, uh, gets ready to declare war on another country, 
they never bring their ambassadors out with any fanfare. They're stolen away in the night, right? They're taken away quietly and discreetly so as not to alarm the country before they're ready. Ambassadors are called home secretly. And I believe that the Lord Jesus has been calling home his ambassadors secretly for a long time, quietly, without fanfare, much like the passing of John the Baptist. They cut his head off at the national birthday party, and there was only a few ragged men who cared anything about it or who knew anything about it. And they came around and begged for his body, and they drug it away and buried it and went and told Jesus. And Jesus whisked them off secretly to be with himself. Genesis 19, you read the story of Sodom. The judgment of Sodom ended with one believer bolting his door and hiding behind it. His name was Lot. He was sheltered behind the door. Who is the door? It's Jesus. He was sheltered behind the door, and the world was already beating his door down. And the scripture says they came to destroy the door. Well, it wasn't just they had something against the door, and it wasn't primarily that they wanted to get Lot. They wanted to get who it was inside Lot's house with him. <laughs> and you just think what you want to, but I'll give you a modern-day version of it. Every Christian, every true believer in this room tonight and in this country tonight, we're sheltered behind the door. The door is Jesus. And I'll tell you who's sheltered behind the door with us. He is. Jesus was a reality to Lot and a reality in his home. He was a guest and not a guest, a resident in Lot's home. He and Lot were in there having fellowship. And when the people came to beat the door down, it wasn't to get Lot and it wasn't just to destroy the door, it was to get the one who was in there with him. And we tonight are going to see this age end this way. The word destroy means to corrupt, it means to ruin, it means to pollute. And I've never had so much hammering on the door of my heart as I've had in the last few weeks and months, hammering on the door of my heart with one strategy, one intention, destroy the door. You know who the door is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I wouldn't have a problem in my life tonight. I wouldn't have a problem in my life tonight if I would make a solemn vow before God that I would never preach his gospel again or never mention the name of his son again. Do you believe that? I wouldn't have problem one. I'd become a friend of the world tomorrow. Everybody that now hates me would love me. The friends that I've lost over the last few years would come back in droves. And I would rapidly become a very popular man, very happy, very contented man. Oh, no. What I'm trying to tell you is it's getting dangerous out there to believe in Jesus. You believe that? It's getting dangerous. That's the way it ended in Sodom. Do you know what happened in Sodom? <laughs> Listen carefully. Lot tried to tell them, and it says that every time he tried to tell them, he seemed to them as one who what? Mocked. Mocked. They made fun of him. They said he's crazy. Who wants to hear him? He's off his rocker. Pay no attention to him. And let me tell you something. At the very last moment, God took Lot out of Sodom. But he took him out without any fanfare, and he took him out without any commotion. He took him out quietly, and he took him out discreetly in the night. And let me tell you the saddest part of all, there wasn't anybody in Sodom who even knew he was gone, and there wasn't anybody in Sodom who cared. Read the story of Noah's generation. I'm going to give you something maybe you didn't know before. Read it in Matthew 24. It says that after Noah had gone into the ark and God sent the flood, that the people continued right on eating and drinking and making merry. And the scripture says that the flood came and took them all, and they knew it not. You know what that means? The day after Noah was shut up in the ark and gone, the day after his family had disappeared from the face of the earth, there wasn't even anybody who could even remember he'd ever lived. And uh, this explains a few problems. I said God was taking his ambassadors home. I say the shepherd is calling his sheep home quietly, one at a time. 
I believe this. I say he's putting his stars out one at a time and very slyly is not replacing them and nobody's noticing. Because you see, the people who are in darkness in this country imagine that they see because they've made for themselves all of this artificial light that I was telling you about this morning. When night comes, people light artificial lights and they say we can see and who needs the sun. We have all the artificial light any country needs tonight. The churches are filled with artificial light. Artificial light is flooding the whole country and the country says they can see, but they're in darkness and the stars are going out and they're not noticing. And let me give you a classic example. Oh, it's such a touching thing. And I'll explain it for those of you who don't know this dear lady. We had a dear saint of God, a woman I met many years ago up in northern Ohio, who moved to one of the southern states because she was old and infirm and her son had her placed in a rest home. We communicated with her in material things, the assembly center love gifts. We fellowshiped with her down through the years, visited with her once or twice, exchanged letters with her almost every month. Precious saint of God. You know what she spent her last years doing way up in her 80s, bedridden, she sent her, spent her last year writing letters, sending tracts, trying to reach everybody she could to tell them that the lights were going out. Nobody paid any attention. She seemed as one who mocked. Just a few months ago, she went to be with Jesus. And from that nursing home, she went to... <laughs> the lights just went out in the building. Is it still running? Okay. She went home to be with the Lord very quietly we didn't even get as much as a postcard. We didn't get a telephone call. She died and went to be with Jesus and nobody in the nursing home knew it or cared. Nobody in the state cared. But the important thing is that light went out there and it wasn't replaced. It was the only light there and there isn't any light there now. It's gone. Her nurse stole the tape recorder that we sent her and the tapes that we mailed down to her. Her son, who knew we had corresponded with her for years, never even honored me with a postcard. We found out by calling long distance to the nursing home to see what her physical condition was and learned that ten days before she had gone home to be with Jesus. He's calling his sheep home very quietly. He's not making any big fuss about it. And this explains a problem that I've had for a long time in thinking about the rapture. I'm getting to the end of my message, okay? Listen. Did you ever hear the rapture presented? Some of you have heard me long enough to have because I preached it this way one time. And, and when they told you about the rapture, they told you that suddenly the Lord would appear from heaven and he would catch all of his people up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and that some would be engineers on a train and the train would run off the track and uh, somebody would be driving a Greyhound bus and it would run into a telephone pole and somebody would be flying an airplane and it would crash and it'd be automobile wrecks all over the United States and the streets would just be filled with people roaming up and down crying and screaming and saying where are our loved ones and the newspapers would have big black headlines and says millions disappear millions vanish and the courts would be just absolutely buried with cases of people trying to claim the estates of those who had disappeared and Congress would have a special emergency meeting and the United Nations would be called into special sessions. You ever hear the rapture preach like that? The schools would shut down, the hospitals would close, nothing would function, and the whole world would be in turmoil looking for the millions of people that disappeared. Well, it ain't so. <laughs> Little raptures are taking place all over the world tonight. People are going home to be with Jesus and they're not being replaced. Oh, now listen, I am not saying there isn't any event called the rapture. I'm telling you that when the rapture does take place, there will be so few people left on the face of the earth to take that they won't even know anybody disappeared. I'll tell you why. If I disappeared from Belpre tonight, there wouldn't be anybody tomorrow know I was gone because there ain't anybody in Belpre cares. In fact, they would be tickled to death if I disappeared in the morning and they would sure never bother asking a question for fear that they might resurrect me. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Half of the people in Belpre that call themselves my friends would be tickled to death if I dropped dead tonight. I know a lot of people that call themselves my brothers and sisters would be awful relieved if I just disappeared. Let me tell you something. When the rapture takes place, there ain't going to be enough of us left 
to even make a dent in society. You believe that? That's right. Well, how far has the cycle gone? Well, America is going into its final darkness, and I'll tell you how I know that. Number one, the moon is disappearing. The moon is the church. Did I tell you that? Say, what do you mean the church is disappearing? Well, go out to all of these seats of religious learning and ask anybody what the church is and see what kind of answer you get. Huh? You'll know whether the church is disappearing or not. How far would you have to go tonight to find anybody who knew what the church is? The true church, the body of Christ. Go up and down the streets of your town and ask, has anybody seen the church? Where is the church? I want to go to the true church. The first Baptist you'll meet will say, he's right over here, first Baptist church. The first Presbyterian you meet will say, right over here, first Presbyterian church. And the first Camelite you run into will say, right down here, church of Christ. And so forth and so forth and so on. The church is disappearing. The moon is already disappearing in America. The stars are disappearing. How far would you have to go to find Christians tonight? How many Christians do you know? Lots of you people have traveled. How many do you know in different parts of the country? We're privileged that we know so many blessed believers through the book ministry. We're privileged. We're probably in touch with the remnant in this country. Praise the Lord for that. And let me tell you this. I'll tell you we're going into the final night of America's history because the moon is disappearing, the stars are disappearing, and here's another sign. The day star has risen. You know what the day star is? It's that bright star that appears after the moon and the stars disappear to announce the coming of the sun. Peter says this day star will arise, but he says it will arise only in your hearts. The world will never see it. The world doesn't see the day star. It's us who see the day star, and it's rising in our hearts. Who is the bright and morning star? Jesus. What does Peter mean, then, that the day star will rise in your hearts? When the day star rises, it comes to a place of prominence, and every eye is on it. And people rejoice in its light. I've never seen a time in 25 years when those people that I believe really know the Lord have had the Lord Jesus Christ rise in their hearts like he's rising now, where their eyes have been on him like their eyes are on him now, where they've rejoiced in what they see in him, in the light that's in him like they're rejoicing now. When I started out in the ministry 28 years ago, most of the Christians I know rejoiced in doctrine. It was all the doctrinal discussion, all Bible study, all doctrinal discussion. The Christians I know now are talking about Jesus. And I say that he has risen in the hearts of God's people. For the conclusion of this message, please turn the tape over. You know what the day star is? It's that bright star that appears after the moon and the stars disappear to announce the coming of the sun. Peter says this day star will arise, but he says it will arise only in your hearts. The world will never see it. The world doesn't see the day star. It's us who see the day star, and it's rising in our hearts. Who is the bright and morning star? What does Peter mean, then, that the day star will rise in your hearts? When the day star rises, it comes to a place of prominence. And every eye is on it. And people rejoice in its light. I've never seen a time in 25 years when those people that I believe really know the Lord have had the Lord Jesus Christ rise in their hearts like he's rising now, where their eyes have been on him like their eyes are on him now, where they rejoice in what they see in him, in the light that's in him like they're rejoicing now. When I started out in the ministry 28 years ago, most of the Christians I know rejoiced in doctrine. It was all the doctrinal discussion, all Bible study, all doctrinal discussion. The Christians I know now are talking about Jesus. And I say that he has risen in the hearts of God's people. That's how far along we are in the cycle. And I'll tell you what follows the rising of the day star, the coming of the sun. But before the coming of the sun, the worst darkness America has ever seen will end the battle of Armageddon. And then the Son of Righteousness will come with healing in his wings. Isn't that a nice storm? 
I'm afraid. Can you listen another 15 or 20 minutes? Okay. You got tape, Lee? All right. I've seen the cycle right here in this valley. I'll let you, I'll let you uh, put the pieces on that, but I've seen the cycle right here in this valley. Take this little locality here. I've been here and the assembly has been here for 23 years. That's a long time. During this 23 year period, starting out in the first, uh, we went to work in darkness. But the light came on. And let me tell you something. There was a lot of light went out from this assembly in the last 23 years. You believe that? Uh, I was on the radio for seven years, two of those years daily. I was on television for a little while. We printed thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of literature. We preached, held Bible studies in all the little communities around this whole valley. I can't hardly think of a place in this valley that I haven't been to have a Bible study or to talk about Jesus. Public meetings and private meetings, I can truly say, like Paul, door to door, publicly and privately testifying, giving the whole counsel of God, 23 years. Then I noticed something happened. It began to happen back in 1959. After seven years on the radio, just one day the Lord said, no more. And he took me off the radio. And I didn't understand it, but my last message, I have the notes of that message yet. And my last message was that God was bringing judicial darkness into this area. Else why would he remove the truth that had been preached for seven years on that radio broadcast? But he closed the broadcast down. I used to preach four times a week. I did it year after year, year in and year out. I preached four times a week. I saw the time when the Lord just said, uh, you're going to have to get out of the church business. And we got out of the church business and we were ended up over in the union hall. And I thought about a big program over there, and we offered the city of Parkersburg, if you remember, the gospel every Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. You remember what I said about that? I said, we're going to have it at 2 o'clock so everybody that's in the churches who really wants the truth can come. <laughs> we didn't have to set up any extra chairs. It was such a colossal failure that we just canceled our Sunday afternoon meeting and rescheduled it at 10 o'clock in the morning because there wasn't anybody in the church that wanted the truth anyway. And then we had a Sunday morning, a Sunday night meeting, a Wednesday night meeting, little by little. The Lord shut the Sunday night meeting down. He shut the Wednesday night meeting down. And uh, there's many other ramifications to that. A year ago, I offered to the assembly. I offered to come to any one of your homes, any time, any place, and sit down with any of your friends or your relatives or your neighbors and talk to them about Jesus. Remember when I gave a whole message about the whole meeting? I haven't had a home meeting in six months. Now, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But there don't seem to be any desire. There don't seem to be any interest. It just seems like, even right here, that uh, the lights are just uh, kind of going out. And do you know that when the lights begin to go out here in the assembly, God did something else. He did something wonderful. He raised up tape ministry. And he said, I'll take the light that I've given here and I've taken the truth that I've given here and I'll give it to the body. I'll give it to the remnant and he's been doing it. And people are hearing it. Some of those people are here tonight. Well, I want to tell you this before I quit. I found something wonderful in the Gospel of John and I have to share it with you. And I'm having an awful lot of competition with that rain. What's Jesus doing now in the body? What's he doing spiritually with the body now? I asked the Lord that the other day. What phase are we in? The ministry's changing. What phase are we in? Where are we? And he said, read the Gospel of John. I said, Lord, I've read the Gospel of John so many times. What will I look for? He said, just think about the Gospel of John. So I sat down and thought about it the other day. And I begin at chapter 1. I did this one time when I was sick two or three years ago. I laid there in bed and closed my eyes and tried to think the Bible through. Tried to start at Genesis 1 and 
recall to my memory all the scripture I can remember in the first chapter of Genesis and what it was about and then to the second chapter and then the third chapter. See how far I get through the Bible. I got lost there along about Obadiah. <laughs> but anyway, I sat down and began to think over the Gospel of John and I saw the whole cycle in that book and I found out where we were and what he was doing with us. Let me tell it to you briefly. Gospel of John opens the first chapter. The subject is light. Light coming into the darkness. Isn't that where it opens? And the darkness comprehending it not. So the cycle begins there, just like the solar cycle. And the first chapter is all about this true light. It's all about this light that lights every man that comes into the world. And then in chapters 2, on through chapters 8, you have nothing but the story of personal salvation. All you read about in chapters 2 through 8 is people getting saved. Andrew gets saved, and he tells Peter, and he gets saved. Bartholomew gets saved. Nathaniel gets saved. Nicodemus gets saved. The woman at the well gets saved. The poor crippled man who lay by the pool of Bethsaida, he got healed. The blind man got his eyes open. The woman at the well, just go on through there. Nothing but the story of personal salvation, because whenever light comes, salvation follows. Now the cycle is starting, you see. Bear with me for a minute. In John 9, there's a change in the Gospel of John. One whole chapter devoted to a little, apparently, insignificant thing, the opening of the blind man's eyes. You say, well, I didn't say insignificant. Yes, it is, in the fact that he opened many other blind eyes. And there wasn't but two or three words that recorded it. But here a whole chapter is devoted to the story, and it opens with this statement by the Lord Jesus that he was about to demonstrate why he came into the world. And then he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet what? Day. For the night cometh when no man can work. He sensed that the night was coming. And so he set before them this man with his eyes now open and showed him the wonderful explanation of why he came. In chapter 10, he talks about the shepherd and his sheep. And it's all about one-on-one, -on -one. the shepherd and his sheep, the sheep that hear his voice, the sheep whose name is known to the shepherd, the sheep who rests in the good shepherd who gave his life, the sheep who knows that he has eternal life, he knows that he'll never lose that life, that he's been made one with the shepherd. And then in chapter 11, he gives to the nation the greatest sign of all, the resurrection. He says, Lazarus before him. A man raised from the dead, and after they have rejected the resurrection sign, in chapter 12, he turns to the nation and explains plainly why he would die. He told them that he would be lifted up, he'd draw men unto himself, now listen carefully, pronounces the gospel, preaches the gospel, but it's his last public gospel message. And in the 12th chapter of John, he gives his final message, listen. Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, you better believe in the light, that you may be children of the light. And these things spake Jesus, and then departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And the saying of Isaiah the prophet was fulfilled, which said, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and spake of him. And then he went on to say, he that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. But he that rejecteth me receiveth not my words. He hath, not, he hath one that judge The same shall judge him in that last day. And I believe that that was approaching Israel's high noon very closely. And he said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. 
and he never preached another message to the public. But in chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, he withdraws himself privately with his disciples, comforts them, encourages them, reveals himself to them, loves them, washes their feet, prays with them. Oh, it's so precious. Chapters 13 through 17, nothing but the intimate personal relationship of Jesus with his own people. He never goes to public again. Doesn't preach anymore to them. Says, you've rejected me, the light's going out. And I believe, I believe that's where we are right now. That's where the ministry's been for months, just comforting his people, speaking to the hearts of the saints, talking about one-on-one -on -one Jesus, the sheep and his shepherd, talking about the bridegroom, letting him wash our feet, comforting our hearts, becoming real to us. Oh, Jesus is more real to me tonight than he's ever been in my life. You with me? Chapter 18 and 19, listen, I mean the lights go out and are never seen again in Israel because it ends with the rejection, the trial, and the crucifixion, and the death of Jesus Christ. Then the end of the book, what do you have? <laughs> he comes again in the resurrection. He comes again in the resurrection. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that America's in that cycle. This valley's in that cycle. When he withdraws himself, when he hides himself, when the lights go out, he will meet with his people. He'll comfort them. He'll encourage them. He'll wash their feet. He'll pray with them. He'll reveal himself as a shepherd to them. Oh, he won't leave you. When the lights went out in Egypt, they went on in every tent that the Israelites lived in. Egypt didn't have a light in the land, but every Israelite had light in his tent. And I'll tell you, we'll have light in ours. There may not be as many of us in the tent, but we'll have light. And Jesus will meet there with us, and he'll encourage and comfort and bless our hearts. And I'll tell you how America's day of light is going to end. It's going to end with the public death of Jesus Christ. They announced the public death of God a few years ago. God is dead. And you'll see the time that the rapture doesn't come quickly when you won't be able to find anybody out there that believes in Jesus Christ. I can't hardly find anybody now, can you? You know what they're going to have left? Darkness. You know what the darkness is? Mystery of iniquity. You know what the mystery of iniquity is? It's a false Christianity. It's a scheme of godliness that denies the power thereof. It's a gospel that says it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and is the gospel of Satan. I'll tell you what kind of light they're going to have. They're going to have the light of the mystery of iniquity. Now I'm going to close this message, but if you want to do some studying on your own and something that will open your eyes, ask yourself these questions. Why is there so much to do over the nation's birthday? Why is it bicentennial year? Why is it that everybody is celebrating the birth of our nation? What's this giant national birthday party all about? And number two, is there anything in the Bible about birthday parties? <laughs> See if you can find anything about birthday parties in the Bible and read about them. There's two, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, both of them national birthday parties. You'd be amazed at what happened to those national birthday parties. I'll tell you that the one in the Old Testament opened with a national scandal and all of the president's advisors were put in prison over it. <laughs> so, 40th chapter of Genesis, go home and read it and see what you make out of it and find out where the saints were when the nation was celebrating their birthday. The saints were personalized in the one person of Joseph. You know where he was? Where was he? In Dungeon. You know how he got there? Bad woman put him there. You know who this bad woman was? She was a bad woman who tried to corrupt him. And because she could not corrupt him, she had him arrested and put in prison because she falsely accused him. But before she did, she stripped him of his robe. There's a bad woman in prophecy. You know what her name is? Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. 
You know what she's doing to the saints tonight? She's stripping us of our robe in public. You know what she's going to do with us? She's going to put us in jail. You know why? Because she can't corrupt us. Because we won't quit telling the truth. And then you go over and read about the birthday party in the New Testament. Who had it? Herod? National birthday party. Do you know where the truth was? In jail. You know what his name was? John. Do you know why he was there? Bad woman put him there. Do you know why the bad woman put him there? Because she couldn't corrupt him. Her name was Herodias. Do you know why she had him arrested? Because he kept telling the truth about her. She said it was all lies, and he ought to be locked up, but it was a solemn gospel truth. He told, he dared to tell the king, and he dared to tell the nation what kind of a tramp woman she was. And she had him locked up and covered up his trial laws right now. And I'll tell you who that bad woman was. That bad woman was the same bad woman in Revelation 17. And she'd like to cover up our trial laws. She'd like to put us in jail because we keep telling everybody what a bad woman she really is. That's right. And do you know what happened to poor old John at the birthday party of the nation? <laughs> he got deheadilated. They cut his head off. That's what they did. They silenced him. They shut up his mouth. I'm not going to talk to you about this subject anymore. It's the end of the line. I had to say it because it's been on my heart since last October. And I realize it's uh, strange and it may seem far-fetched to you. I believe that we're in the closing moments of the gospel era in America. I believe the lights are going out. I believe the word is going to be increasingly scarce. And I believe we have to be the most blessed people on the face of the earth. We've had so much of it. Right. We've had so much of it. Let us pray. Father, thank you. How could we ever thank you for the grace and mercy that you've shown to us? We praise your name tonight. We give you thanks and we give you glory. Yes, we expect some hard times ahead, Father, because the bad woman of the professing church will keep accusing us and she'll never stop until she shuts her mouth. But she can't do that unless you let her. We're already in a prison. We're limited as to where we can preach. We're limited to those who will hear us. We're almost limited to what we can say. So few want to hear, Father. We're already in a prison, and maybe one day soon you'll just close her mouth and keep us from saying any more like you did John the Baptist. We know this, Father, that just as soon as they cut his head off, Jesus came and secretly removed the saints to a desert place to be with him. Father, we know that moment is not far off in history. Perhaps even tonight, this very moment, Jesus will come with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, as we see America's destiny being formed now, as we see this 200-year history of this proud nation come to an end, and we see how she's come from such blessing to such curse and such privilege to such judgment, and all because she turned her back on the gospel of your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. She truly indeed will become a hellhole with hyenas living in it. America will surely feel and experience the heavy hand of judgment upon her. Perhaps, Father, that she is that great Babylon of which you prophesied that the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will no longer be heard in her. And to whom you cried from heaven, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. Perhaps that's the rapture cry, Father, who are we to know? But we know this, it won't be long. Thank you for the open door we've had. And Father, I just want to tell you this for myself. I thank you that you let me live in this time. It's a precious time. Precious time. What a privilege, Father. And what a privilege to be able to speak thy word. Thank you for the saints of God who are gathered here tonight, whose hearts love Jesus. We think, Father, that fellowship is going to become more precious and more important than ever before in the days ahead. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.